Thank you all for coming. Um, this one is near and dear to my heart because uh, this, is, this is the work that I started doing many years ago. Um, and we're very excited to share with you hopefully what will be a few inspirational ideas that are coming from developers who are working particularly in informal learning spaces. Um, so I'm not going to take too much time. I want you to hear what they have to say. And then we hope to have time for Q&A at the end. Um, so I'm going to introduce them all up front. First, we have Thomas Knowlton. He works at the New York Public Library. And he's going to help talk about um, how we can use this type of media to encourage community members to find and make good choices. Um, next, we have Barry Joseph, who is from the American Museum of Natural History, uptown from here. Um, and he's going to show how he is pushing the boundaries with new interactive models at the museum, um, which I want to try out with my kid next weekend. Um, then we have uh, Leika Umer. She is from the New York Hall of Science. And Leika is going to talk about how designing for these kinds of spaces can help to redefine what is traditionally considered learning. Next to Leika is Bill Shribman. He works at WGBH in children's media. He does many things there. And he's going to talk about how the importance of public media for reaching underserved audiences and other groups of kids who may not have access to this material in other forms. And then lastly, we have Ciara Bush. And Ciara works at Girl Scouts of the USA. She's going to talk about how we can use digital learning to bridge real world and digital experiences to support more engaged citizens, which I know no one here thinks we need more of. <laughs> um, so thank you for joining. Please keep in mind your great questions for the end. And with that, Tom. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Thomas Knowlton and I'm a school outreach librarian at New York Public Library. So as part of my job, I use games in two distinct ways that I'm gonna talk about. Um, the first one is NYPL Arcade. Um, so this is something I created just over five years ago in 2012 with the idea of providing hands-on access to video games in a library setting. Um, and this has evolved over time. Um, it was initially for adult patrons, um, but later tailored to teens. Um, and then now um, we're actually doing even more uh, of these large all ages events, um, sort of that run the gamut as far as age um, and content as well. Uh, so the second way in which I incorporate games um, is through my work with My Library NYC. So if you're not familiar with it, which a lot of people aren't, um, it's a school outreach partnership between the New York City Department of Education and the three public library systems. Um, it serves approximately 500 public schools, 60,000 educators, and about half a million students across the five boroughs. And how do we do this? Um, by offering a special teacher set catalog of about 100,000 books that they can check out. Um, and these are all to supplement curriculum. Luckily, I'm only responsible for about 35 schools in lower Manhattan, so that makes my job a little easier than the 500. Um, and I should say, um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit near the end, um, but we're also expanding this, uh, the teacher site catalog, to include games as well. So what is NYPL Arcade, um, and how did I sort of define it or try to talk to my colleagues about it when I wanted to do this thing with games? Um, so originally I told them, well, it's a book discussion, but for video games. Um, and so this is a really nice fit, at least at the public library, um, because libraries have always been sort of this unique confluence of books, scholars, popular culture, and also a place for community to gather. Um, and so it definitely seemed like games could have a place there. But as time went on, um, I sort of refined you know, how I talked about NYPL Arcade, and I explained to people that it's an opportunity to play, discuss, and watch independent, experimental, and thought-provoking games. Um, so I'll just unpack that just a little bit here. Um, so play is all about access. Again, this is sort of a fundamental value or association with libraries um, that a lot of us have. 
Um, but then discussion, this idea of sort of a public forum to discuss games. Um, and so, you know, I, I like to think of this uh, in this way. Um, reading is often a very solitary activity, right? But as soon as you finish a book, what is the first thing you want to do? Um, a lot of us want to go and discuss the book, right? So we, we join book discussions, um, or we call up a friend, or uh, we interact that, with others in some way. And so games are the same way. So not all games, of course, multiplayer games, um, but uh, a lot of games um, are solitary experiences, right? But I think that uh, it's kind of a unique thing to be able to come together, have this kind of space um, with uh, this ability to sort of share that with other people. So I'm going to talk about three games um, really quickly that kind of embody the different kinds of things um, that I look for when thinking about using a game. So we've probably used, I actually haven't updated my count, but it's over 100 games over the last five years that we've shared, probably closer to like 120 games at this point. Um, so I'm just going to talk about three of them. Um, so the first is Journey um, by That Game Company. Um, and so this was one of the first, this was the very first series that we actually did at the library. And what really appealed to me, other than, you know, Journey had just been released in 2012, if you can think back um, to that. Um, so that was very appealing because it was very of the moment. There were lots of think pieces and people who were really excited about it, that forum where everyone was sharing, you know, these tales of, um, you know, communicating through the game. Um, so that was all very exciting, but also it came out of an academic academic environment, right? So USC, um, game, game Innovation Lab. And so what that meant was I could immediately um, point people in the direction of sort of this academic free content. Um, and so what was that? That was um, you know, a, brow a browser-based prototype, a flow um, that they could play. So it wasn't the full, you know, commercial release, of it, but I could point to that and say, see, this is, you know, this is the thing that I'm trying to do. Um, also, you could download Genova Chen's thesis um, on flow theory, and that, of course, you know, linked to a book that we had in the collection. Um, and so that was all really exciting, um, and it's a way to open the conversation, I think, with without getting into all these like sometimes difficult conversation, right? About, you know, about budgets and digital rights management and all that. Sometimes we can get bogged down in that. Um, so I definitely look for this sort of free open content, not necessarily the games themselves, but at least something that surrounds the game. So prototypes or design documents, um, something like that. So Spec Ops Align is another good example of something I look for, um, and that is intertextuality. So this can obviously mean a book like Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, um, from which the game takes a whole lot of um, its structure and um, a lot of its themes and ideas. Um, but also, you know, how does Spec Ops the Line interact with um, you know, third-person military shooters and you know, the themes that are present in that? How is it commenting and critiquing those? So I think that's another type of intertextuality. A third example that I'll give you is uh, Plated's Limbo. Um, and this is a great example of sort of something that's very, very immediate. So obviously we have the, um, Art Jensen makes reference to Duvet, uh, Jansen's uh, Moomin series, um, but also it has sort of an immediacy. It's kind of the perfect game to teach um, game design. It only has two buttons. It's a two-button game, um, you know, black and white, um, and uh, it looks like my <laughs> slides are on a timer. Um, so this uh, brings me to the work that I do with, in schools with My Library NYC. Um, and so this, uh, what you see here is a high school in lower Manhattan where we're doing an after school game club. Um, so why, this, why is this um, important or how does this supplement curriculum? Well, this is an opportunity to bring, in this case, Overcooked, so a BAFTA award winning game. Um, and so I love this um, because I'm able to, you know, rather than just throwing a random game on the screen, we can do sort of award winning games, we can talk about a concept like iteration and we can, I can pull things from interviews with the designers talking about that. So so not every you know, student needs to become a game designer, but I want them to understand that that's a path they could take or that's a way of self-expression um, that is open to them. Um, another way that we use games in schools is, um, as I mentioned, we're starting to circulate, as of this fall, we'll be circulating around 100 tabletop games. So that's really exciting. This, we were lucky enough to have Colleen Macklin, who we heard speak this morning um, briefly, and John Sharp uh, from Local Number 12 and Parsons. Um, and uh, so not only did they demo the metagame for students, but also for the teachers. And I think putting games in teachers' hands, it really uh, makes them start to see all of a sudden their teacher was talking about, oh, I could see how I can use this next year. Um, 
and uh, I could apply it in this way for this class. So two other quick things that I want to just touch on. Um, we're also, I mentioned, we're doing a lot with sort of these all ages, very inclusive events. This is at Antiprom um, 2016. Um, so this is a long running event. Um, that is uh, target, it's open to all high schoolers in New York City, but specifically ones who um, feel like they need an alternative safe space um, because they may not feel welcome at official school programs, dances, or because of their sexuality, gender presentation, the way they dress, or any other reason. Um, and so this is an example of a long running event at the library where we could bring games and sort of um, share them with people who might not otherwise encounter them. Um, and one last example um, of an all ages event um, is summer reading games day. So that was just this past week, or <laughs> on Saturday actually. Um, and so we shared, uh, Tracy Fullerton was in the audience and um, introduced Walden and she sat next to, you know, eight year olds, six year olds, and they experienced Walden the text via a game for the very first time. You know, encountering um, ideas um, in that way I think is really, really exciting and sort of, you know, bringing a book to life. Um, so that is my presentation. Thank you so much. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or email. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. I work at the American Museum of Natural History uptown. My name is Barry Joseph. I'm the Associate Director for Digital Learning. If you haven't been to the museum before, you might have heard of us. We have dinosaurs. <laughs> Some other things, too. Uh, and one of those other things you might not know about is games. Uh, we have games in a number of areas in our public programs. Like, uh, we actually partnered with Games for Change a few years ago to have uh, video games be part of the Margaret Mead Film Festival showing video games about cultural issues around the world. In our exhibits right now, you can come to our Cuba exhibit and you can play uh, a, a version of Cuban dominoes. Um, if you have a young person who's in our youth programs and might have used Minecraft or helped us develop uh, Micro Rangers, which we spoke about last year, an augmented reality mobile game, you can play now in the museum. And products, we work with young people and our scientists to make card games. And those are three of the card games that, that are available both online for download and for sale. But what I want to talk with you about for the next few minutes is about none of these. I want to talk about what we've been doing with escape rooms. Put up your hand if you've heard of escape rooms. Put your hands down. Put your hands up if you've played at least one escape room. All right, so you guys know a little bit about escape rooms. For those who don't, one of my favorite definitions comes here from Scott Nicholson. Escape rooms are live action, team-based games where players discover clues, solve puzzles, and accomplish tasks in one or more rooms in order to accomplish a specific goal, usually escaping from the room, in a limited amount of time. Um, if you have only started hearing about escape rooms recently, it's not, it shouldn't be a surprise. 2014, there were about 22 escape room locations in the country, and as of last week, there's now 1,800. And this comes from a room escape artist. This, that just came out this weekend, all right? But I've been to escape rooms, and I went a few years ago, and I thought, these are super fun, but I can't imagine what we can possibly do with one of them in a museum. And then I learned about the Fort Stanwyck escape room. Has anyone here been to Fort Stanwyck in upstate New York? All right. Well, if you do, designed by Scott Nicholson, you can experience an escape room. And in this historic fort, which was at the time of the revolution, you get to figure out the um, weak spots inside the fort because you were trying to help a saboteur. So you need to figure out where the weak spots are and then inform the saboteur. But the fort knows the saboteur is out there, so they're trying to stop you. So you are working in a real physical space to understand its real physical location using real cryptographic techniques that were used at the time of the revolution. So when you're done with the escape room, you've learned something about the actual physical history of the space that you're in, and now you can actually go explore that space. Now, I didn't get to do it, but I did a simulation of it at um, GLS Games Learning and Society a few years ago, and I thought, wait a second, maybe these things can be educational. But if I wanted to make one, I thought to myself, where am I ever gonna find the resources? Who's thinking about this stuff with education? And then last year, I was at Mind Fair in Philadelphia. Anyone go to Mind Fair, the Minecraft convention? We saw a few hands here, great, excellent. So you see, if you want to know more about it, talk to them. And I met there Adam Bellow, who was doing an escape room, and obviously it was Minecraft themed, so these are my kids playing it, actually twice, even though they solved it, they wanted to do it again. <laughs> and his company, Breakout EDU, he's based here in New York, they support educators to bring escape rooms into learning settings, offering kits and curriculum for an emerging community of games-based learning educators all around the world. 
And so we contacted them, got some advice for them, and then we were able to create last January, what we did at the Museum of Natural History as a prototype, Escape the Planet. And what I'm gonna do is take you first in front of the screen. Here's what the visitors came who came to Escape the Planet. And I'll take you behind the scenes. So here we have the visitors arriving at the lower level of the Hall of the Universe. Uh, they don't know exactly what's gonna happen. They don't know what they signed up for, but they were, wanted to come and give it a shot. And then they came into a dark room. It's a room that has benches and a screen. There's usually a video that's playing. We turned it off. We gave the space to the high school students that we worked with all week to co-develop it. And so you can't really see, but that's a high school student in the front. And she's explaining that you were on a ship that crashed on Mars, and you have uh, 30 minutes to get the message off to the rescue ship before the oxygen runs out and you're all going to die. <laughs> all right. Lights on. 30 minutes. Time to escape. So now they're, they're looking all around the room. They don't know what to do. Where is the puzzle? Where is the problem? They're, they're reading some information on the wall, seeing if there's any clues. And then some people notice there's some boxes that need keys. They don't know where the keys are. Someone says, maybe, maybe they're behind the pictures. Nope. They're underneath the benches. So they look under the benches. They have these little magnetic boxes. They find the keys. Let's see if the audio is going to work now. There's two boxes. Each one had a different HoloLens in it and all the material required to solve two separate puzzles, one about the constellations and one about the solar system. The idea was to have um, an asymmetrical informational relationship. So whoever was wearing the HoloLens had to navigate um, uh, astro science visualization but couldn't, didn't know what to do with the information. The people who were not wearing the HoloLens needed that information. They'd have to communicate with each other. So we wanted to see, could we gamify a VR experience to make it social? in a museum context, and could we just make it social with or without the game, requiring people to talk to each other? All right, so first one's open, one person's putting it on, the other person's reading the information. Uh, here we have a student who's looking at, uh, trying to do both at the same time, which is really quite difficult to do, looking at different solar system uh, uh, relationships with the planets, and looking at it at the same time uh, in his HoloLens. Um, here we have the, one of the boys there with um, the light to the UV light looking at secret clues that will be revealed, such as, I found this, 17, so we found a number. What does it mean? Who can use it? They'll have to fi figure it out. All right, here they are still trying it out. I love this photo. We have someone on the right wearing the HoloLens looking at it. The, 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 the two adults on the left looking at the material but talking with the boy in orange about what it means while the boy in the middle um, has a lock. He's trying to unlock something. So she's looking at the XYZ coordinates of a star in a particular constellation that they had to figure out which one to find. <laughs> <laughs> she said the right numbers. They opened up the box. The boy in red is the one who opened up the special communicator crystal, bring it to the facilitator. They did it. They are cheering. They are exciting. They own the experience. And Hugging each other, very happy, very, very happy <laughs> after 30 minutes. All right, so this, let's go to the other side of the screen now. So this was made through a four-day youth program all day. If you're not from New York, we have Regents Weeks. Essentially, long story short is the kids can't leave town, but they're not in school most of the time. So we, can, we do experimental programs during that week. So here they are with the Astro Educator, in this case, breaking down the two different puzzles, the solar system puzzle and the constellation puzzle. And here we have them trying on HoloLens for the first time, learning how to use your hand gesture to control it. And then ha here we are now at the table working in their group to say, okay, I have this visualization of the constellation. How do I build this into a puzzle? What kind of scaffolding is required? What kind of clues are required? What kind of red herrings do I want to use? Here they are playing um, Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes mm -hmm. to learn about how you need to coordinate in some game designs where the mechanics uh, uh, split up the information across two groups and they have to coordinate. You can see she's not happy. They're about to blow up. <laughs> now here they are in the theater. Now, this is one of my favorite moments when they came in. and They're sitting on the bench very nicely, orderly, just like all of you guys are. But then we said, this is your space. You can do what you want. So what'd they do? They stood on the benches. So imagine all of you started standing on the chairs right now. That would feel odd, right? But at that moment, they didn't feel odd. They felt like they owned it. And I love that moment of transition where they realized, oh, OK, this isn't just like school anymore. We are actually being given the power and authority to create something, create something new in this space that was originally here for something else. 
And they came and they measured everything about that space. This is one of multiple pages of them detailing everything. One door, six benches, four pegs underneath each bench, uh, two boxes left uh, side of the bench. So they knew what the assets were that they could play with when they, when they designed the experience with us. Here they are designing the art for the walls. Here they are now back in the room. This is now the last day, setting everything up, putting all the materials in the right boxes, the right locations on the wall, under the right benches, seeing where the magnetic spots were to connect things. Uh, and then here they are, mere moments before what you saw before, before the group came in and they started. And that was the experience. So that was just a very short little basic prototype we did in January. You can't come play it now. It's just a prototype. Maybe someday. Who knows? But you can go to Philadelphia right now, as I did last month, where two months ago at the Franklin Museum, they opened two different escape rooms. Um, and I went, and you can see us, we won. We did the Astro themed one in the lower right. Um, and these are not designed to be educational games. They're run by a local and developed by a local escape room company in Philadelphia. Their goals are to get people into the museum, show them a good time, and let them use technology, which is actually part of the mission of the Franklin. In this case, I got to use 8-track tapes. They put videos in 8-track tapes, which was fun. <laughs> right? It was an 80s-themed uh, escape room as well, for some reason. Um, and, and this is another reason to think about escape rooms, right? How many times have you been in a museum and you felt stupid, right? You are looking at some art and you're like, I don't get this. Or you're in a science museum, you know? Just, let me see you show of hands. Who's felt stupid in a museum before, right? Thank you. Do you feel like taking a photo of yourself and putting it on social media at that time? Probably not, right? So here are people that I found on social media, and there's thousands of these. They've lost the escape room. They fail. And what do they want to do? They want to hold up goofy signs that show their failed status, and they want to share it. For them, learning can be fun and engaging, even when it's hard. So watch out. Escape rooms coming to a museum near you. Now, I don't have time to talk about it now, but you can go to my blog if you want, Mushmi, and you can see more about the evaluation we did of what we learned from gamifying, uh, bringing VR, into the museum, what we learned from using escape rooms uh, with visitors to see how it affected their engagement with science content. Um, and so just go, go to uh, mushmi.org, type in uh, Escape the Planet, and you can learn more about it there. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Leika Umer, and I'm from the New York Hall of Science. So um, what I do is I'm actually a research assistant there. I had kind of an interesting journey toward doing what I do now. Um, some years ago, I started as a museum docent, and I worked my way up toward um, in something that we have, something called the science career ladder, and I ended up with the research and development team. So what we kind of really focus on is bridging the gap between that playful learning experience that we see kids having when they're at the museum with the often disengaging experience that kids have when they're learning in school. Oh, okay. So, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is playground physics, a science education model that incorporates play into learning. So everything that we do at the Hall of Science is really informed by this approach that we have called design make play. So design make play is kind of like this inform this uh, learning methodology that we have at the museum that's really all about intrinsically motivating experiences and a low barrier to entry so that all learners, even the youngest or most reluctant, can engage with STEM activities and still experience success. So the design is really all about the, this iterative design process. Make is really about making accessible complex tools, but also teaching kids to use what they have in front of them. Everything is, game, everything is a game and everything is playful. And then play, have fun, mess around, but also the deep engagement that comes with engaging in play. So something kind of born out of that design make play philosophy are our suite of noticing tools of which Playground Physics is one. Playground Physics specifically is a five year research and development initiative that was sponsored by the US Department of Education's Investing in Innovation Grant. And um, it involves developing an app, curriculum, and professional development. Over the course of the five years, we, um, we basically had 
an implementation study and an impact study. So we were working with schools all across New York City uh, during the development process, during the impact process, just rolling it out into schools for one year. Then we kind of got results from that. We redid the whole thing, redid the professional development, redid the app, redid the curriculum, rolled it out again, and now we are in the phase of getting results from the second year. So what I'm really going to be focusing on is a lot of challenges that we faced along the way. The playground physics that we have now is nothing like what we had in the beginning. We started off with something that was called the slide game. What we really wanted to do was bring the experience of the science playground that we have at the Hall of Science to kids everywhere. We have a science playground that's focused on simple machines and physics learning. Kids go out there, they have fun, they learn about physics. So we said, OK, let's bring that to everyone. Well. Obviously, the slide game really didn't work out <laughs> for a number of reasons. Um, it started off with having a bunch of sensors that we were strapping to kids connected to an iPhone, and they were sliding down different slides using mats that were made of different materials. So what we learned was kids really didn't like the process of having to interact with all that tech. It was fussy for them, having all these sensors, sliding down, different, sliding down with different mats. They didn't want anything to do with it. They wanted an autonomous system. Something else that happened, um, the slide game has kind of a challenge aspect where you can race your friends down a slide on a different mat. Kids didn't really care about the challenge aspect either. For them, it was all about me. So it's like, what did I do and why is that important? So that's kind of how Playground Physics was born. It's this autonomous system where kids have an iPad. They just record their play performances. So playing catch, throwing a ball, being on a swing, sliding down a slide, or just something that may not even involve them, like watching a slinky go down the stairs and playing cops and robbers while doing it. So something that actually happened. So we finally got to a point where we kind of had the idea of what we wanted playground physics to look like. But then you, of course, faced more challenges. So the thing with tech is it always wants you to kind of go faster, do something more often, input something, and then you magically get answers. But in this specific case, that actually really didn't work for kids. What worked for them was slowing down. So these red dots that you see um, on the screen are actually, in this image, there's a girl throwing a ball. And those red dots are points that the user, which is kids, actually have to follow the path of motion of the ball. So this was really, really important for kids to understand the data that they were entering. So they follow the path of motion of the ball. They're essentially entering the data themselves. So when they get to the next screen and they see these graphs that come up, they're like, oh, so this is where that data is coming from. So an example that we like to use a lot is um, there was once a, a student who he followed the path of motion to the ball. So he gets to the next screen and he's looking at the graph. And you know the graph's kind of going up and down. And he says, oh, OK. so." this graph is not showing me the way that the ball was moving. It's not showing me the path of motion. This graph is showing me the speed of the ball because it doesn't match the way that the ball was moving. So um, something that I think all of us kind of have to face a lot is the question of, is this learning? This doesn't look like the type of learning that educators are used to seeing. Educators often may, may see the value in using games for learning, but it doesn't fit into their existing practices. So they have pressure from administrators to do test prep and align to standards. They really don't have time to be aligning these games to, into their curriculum. So kind of some of the solutions for that for us was really figuring out a way to meet teachers where they're at. So we did the leg legwork of creating the curriculum and aligning to the standards so that teachers had an entry point and justification for using playground physics. And now that the study is over, you know, we can share that playground physics actually really did increase science content learning. So that's one of the outcomes that we have. Teachers felt that it increased student engagement, and kids just generally enjoyed using it. For them, it was learning physics through play. Um, there was this one example that I mentioned earlier of these kids that, that were, um, they were actually in the stairwell, and they were, they were, they had a microphone that they'll all, they often forget they, they're not even wear, they're, that they're wearing. 
So they're playing cops and robbers, and they're literally recording a slinky going down the stairs and tracing the path of motion while playing cops and robbers. So this goes on for like seven minutes or something. And then at, at one point in the recording, um, a kid goes, oh, we're still wearing the microphone. <laughs> so he's like aware that you know whoever's going to listen to this is going to realize that we were doing something that to them they think is playful, but really they're just engaging in learning. So the overall takeaway for, I think, us as game developers, researchers, educators, um, is to just keep challenging existing norms by combining research and development. We need to have actual evidence that we can present to people so that we can really redefine their pre-existing notions of what games for learning are and what they're capable of. Thank you. Hi, so um, I'm uh, Bill Shrippen. I'm a producer of digital content at WGBH in Boston, where we produce a lot of television you might be familiar with. Um, this is some of the content that we make for, for adults or um, uh, grown-ups, as we know them, in the kids' space. Um, this is more my world. Uh, some of these brands you may be familiar with, uh, Zoom, Arthur, Curious George, there's a few there that you're probably uh, less familiar with. Uh, um, my work is really uh, with a team of in-house designers, producers, including Melissa Carlson, who presented on Design Squad earlier today. Um, our work is really at the intersection um, of, of public media, which is PBS, NPR, um, of education and science. So we're kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, but we're also uh, under siege a little bit. Um, there's a theme there. Um, cuts to public media, education, and science. So I'm hoping this isn't the last time I'll get to present here. Because um, we, we do tend to rely on public funding um, because we do, uh, for the most part, uh, pay for our work up front and give it away for free. Um, that was Michelle's note about reaching the underserved. We, we're trying to make sure that as many people as can uh, reach our content. So I'm just going to show you a few different um, ways to, to the note that Constance made this morning about combining game mechanics with, with content. Um, so for the new Ruff Ruffman show, um, we've got a, a series of uh, STEM games for kind of five, six, seven-year-olds. Here are some from one particular game. Um, where we're testing different materials, um, kids dressing up this rhino, and then testing it. And we've even put in um, uh, kind of the inquiry science pieces of, of prediction and documentation that you wouldn't necessarily normally see in games, but um, these are fun and animated. So hopefully kids will be engaged. This will be launching in, in September at PBS Kids. Um, part of that suite, uh, uh, photographic apps, um, again, looking at the same curriculum, but from a different viewpoint. So these are apps where, where kids are looking for materials and finding ones uh, to kind of photobomb these images with, with materials from the real world. Our work involves a lot of kid testing here. We're testing the app um, in after-school programs. That's one of the informal spaces we, we spend a lot of time in. Um, for a related game um, around forces in motion, uh, we're using herring. Um, to force a, a plush toy across the ice, and there's a force meter across the bottom. Um, and we're really trying to address different kinds of learners here. So the, this idea of force and, and force magnitude is, is a tough one for five-year-olds, but we've got it represented by sound, color, uh, colored kind of uh, saturation. There's a sound effect, and there's, there's uh, numeral for kids that are, are able to read the numbers. So we're looking at the force as you move this launcher around. It's a kind of force and trajectory kind of game. But we're taking on board all kinds of learners um, with a kind of UDL, Universal Design for Learning approach. Similarly, um, for Curious George, we built a, a suite of games um, that were really focused on numbers and counting. But here you'll see that we did them all um, bilingually. So these are all available in Spanish, <coughs> again, with a view to uh, making sure we have maximum reach. 
Uh, for plum landing and environmental science, game for slightly older kids, maybe five through eight, uh, we're looking at a number of maybe familiar game mechanics, um, from snood to kind of platformers, but here all of the content is about uh, biodiversity, predators and prey, um, this is an escape the room game that with the uh, eat, help the owl eat the hare. Um, there's a platformer, and again, you see more, more kid testing here as we go. Everything we do is, is kid informed. So we're using familiar game mechanics, but here we've got an environmental science curriculum. Um, so we, we, we try and match those two as best we can. Um, I've snuck a couple of classroom things in here just because uh, it's all the same team. So this is work that we're doing for NASA right now. Um, as part of a project called Bringing the Universe to America's Classrooms. Um, again, more kid testing. We really want to ground truth what we're doing um, with, with what kids really understand. These are maybe five-year-olds, six-year-olds, and understanding here what they, what, they can, what they understand about looking at the world from above, the idea of maps, the idea of satellite imagery. Uh, the work we're doing with NASA is about using NASA imagery. Um, so here we're looking at uh, what kids understand about looking at the world from above. And then that maps into, uh, in this case, a Unity game that we're building um, for classrooms as well as just natively in Unity for the App Store, where they're navigating from above and at ground level an island that we've built through which they'll find different checkpoints, collect trash as a kind of incentive. But along the way, they're finding video and other linear content. Um, that's curriculum based around earth science. Uh, I'm gonna pass through Design Squad because there was a fantastic presentation on it earlier about global um, uh, competency. For Poisonous Handbook, uh, for high school kids, um, we created graphic novels. Uh, again, if you saw the VR presentation that uh, Filament showed this morning about creating uh, games, chemistry games, this is a different way to get poisonous chemicals into the classroom. Um, here in the form of um, a graphic novel. Um, but again, working as we always do with, with, with advisors, here's a, a forensic science chemistry teacher. I notice he's got sheep's brains in his cupboard, so he must be authentic. Um, and so, and this is kind of a lean forward uh, digital graphic novel where you can, in this case, take blood draws from corpses, uh, make tissue uh, dissections, um, you can irradiate uh, bones to look for radium poisoning. Um, and then I'll end here with something that we just launched last week that went um, with a general audience and a, a show for, for adults that we did that goes with the photography of Joel Sartori, if you've seen that on PBS. Um, what we designed for, for, for kids was, was um, not to tell kids what these animals were, but to give them the, the, the opportunity to ask questions. It's a different kind of inquiry science. So we gave them no information except, you know, what questions do you have about these animals? Or what do you see that, ha that they have in common? Uh, and we, we gave the educators uh, kind of a way to work with this, this content so that it's, it was more about getting a conversation going than having facts that kids were just um, given to regurgitate. Um, it was, and we've seen in classroom testing um, just how engaged, engaged kids are when you show them a picture like this and you give them no information and you ask them to talk about it and think about what it might be, how big it is, what it might eat, how it might eat you. Uh, it's, you really get a different way to engage kids with science content if you just let them go for it. So I'm, I'm going to pause there. Thank you. Hi, so um, as said be too close. Okay. Um, I'm from Girl Scouts, and I just want to talk a little bit about we're an uh, over 100 year organization. So uh, obviously, we have a lot of history to build on in today's digital world. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about who our customer is first. Uh, of course, you know, uh, Gen Z is informed. Uh, they've got the internet in their pocket or at home, really accessible, so there's really no 
keeping secrets of the world from them. Um, they're also really connected, social media, text messaging, calling, so uh, no longer do you have to meet up with your friends to find out what they're doing. And they're motivated for social good. So along with being very knowledgeable about everything that's happening, they want to make change in the world and make impact uh, with everything they're hearing, which is great uh, within Girl Scouts uh, because that's what we focus on. Uh, for them, also, digital is a seamless and a given experience. So uh, they don't switch from doing an in-person experience to doing a digital experience. A lot of times, it's all within one experience, and they don't recognize that they're switching. Um, so it's important for us to make sure that we're building in seamless experiences. And finally, for us specifically in Girl Scouts, we serve uh, girls in every zip code of the United States of America. And so there's a lot of diversity to access um, of high-speed internet, technology, and other digital resources. And we really have to keep that in mind because we're creating experiences for everyone, not just girls who might have a smartphone or um, a computer at home or, again, that high-speed internet. So you might know the tradition of Girl Scouts. I, oh, what's that? Yeah, cookies. So teaching girls entrepreneurship skills through our iconic cookie program, um, camping, outdoor experiences, and of course, badges and learning skills uh, through badge and patchwork. Uh, and of course, our mission is girls, you know, build girls of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. And now you know, we think it's valuable to teach girls these 21st century skills in order to fulfill our mission. So the first way that we're doing this and really leveling that playing field um, for all the girls with a variety of access is creating digital citizens. Uh, the first thing that we focus on and we've been focusing on for years is media literacy. So teaching girls critical thinking skills so that the media that they consume, they understand what they're consuming. And then we have, um, I showed you know one of our curricula here, uh, is it's your story, tell it, where there's if for every age level, uh, girls can go through a 10 week program and it helps them to tell their story and rewrite media so that it reflects what's in their lives. And um, you might have seen also recently, just in July, we came out with a ton of new STEM programming. And within that, we're teaching computational thinking skills and also uh, design thinking skills. And this is really not only to help girls prepare themselves for a variety of tech careers, but understand today the technology that they're using uh, and how it operates. Um, and so teaching them stuff like logic or algorithms. And that's all done unplugged, everything I just talked about in the slide. So there is no requirement for any sort of access to a computer, um, any sort of technology. Uh, we also are partnering with world-class organizations who can offer that top-class content. As a nonprofit, we don't always have the resources right, to create it, but we still think it's super important for girls. And so why not leverage the great work that other people are doing for example, I didn't put down here, but we did partner with Design Squad um, for our engineering curriculum that just came out this summer. Uh, we've also partnered with Code.org to create the computer science curriculum that came out, uh, SciStarter for citizen science, and for NASA, we'll be putting out some space science badges. Um, so not only do we do those things, but uh, we do create experiences from the ground up. Uh, part of that are digital tools. So like I talked about before, creating that seamless experience of like, now I'm doing something that's in person, but I'm also supplementing it with a digital experience. Uh, one of those experiences are our Badge Explorer. So it makes sense, right, today that you can go online and look at the badges we offer and choose which ones you want to earn and then find you know, the requirements for that. And that's part of creating that seamless experience for girls and honestly volunteers too who expect that kind of experience. Um, also for the citizen science curriculum that I just talked about before, uh, girls and parents and volunteers will be able to go online and find citizen science projects, complete them, and then mark them as complete, submit their data um, via the site, and then also see what girls across the country are doing and how they're contributing to a greater uh, database of uh, science. Uh, also, as I mentioned before, cookies. <laughs> we sell cookies online now, but we don't do it. Our girls do, right? And so teaching girls, the, like I said, the 21st century skills, entrepreneurship doesn't just start now by like buying the storefront or renting it out and, you know, or selling your lemonade at the lemonade stand. 
so many businesses are started online. And so teaching girls those digital, digital skills to operate a business online as a supplement to their in-person cookie selling experience is really crucial. Um, they can create their site, monitor their sales, um, send marketing emails, thank you notes, and really send girl, uh, you know, adults and people, whoever's buying it, uh, to their site. Uh, and that's all on girls. So the only way you can buy cookies online from a girl is if you know a girl and you have her site, right? So just to tie that all back together, for Girl Scouts, serving girls today really means combining the tradition of what Girl Scouts is and what it means and what it's done for girls for over 100 years uh, with making sure that we're creating digital citizens and then also with world-class partners creating content that's relevant for girls' lives. Thank you very much to our panelists. I have, a, I have a burning question before anyone else joins in from the audience. Bill, what is the gray bumpy thing and can it eat me? <laughs> that is a nudie bump. It's like a sea slug. It's, it's probably only a couple inches. Oh, I feel better now. <laughs> I should have done a little competition, a little game here to see who because sea slug. OK. Some of them are poisonous though. So okay, well, yeah. <laughs> now that I know it's only that big though, I feel better. Okay, um, are, there, are there questions? Yes, go ahead. Just very close to her. Um, so I had a question about just how you determine the age range for games, because you know, as we've been hearing from some talks throughout the day, you know, a lot of gamers are older. Games aren't necessarily for kids, but a lot of the programs that I was hearing about are for children or designed to be intergenerational ideas. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a great question. If I can add just one more nuance to that. Um, the other thing I think is relevant to that is depending on the age, it's the, also the role of the adult in the experience, right? So depending on the age of the kid that you're trying to target and the environment that you're operating in, you have to think about that, that role of an adult differently. So um, Tom, Thomas, do you want to take it first? Sure. Um, so first off, the ESRB and Common Sense Media are two sites that are invaluable for just getting kind of an idea of what to even play. Um, but then past that, where you have, you know, like a little, you know, A for everyone designation, um, I really think you just have to play through the game. And so I've overruled, <laughs> you know, in some cases, or Common Sense Media does a good job of saying, well, yes, you know, this is targeted at, you know, this audience because of, you know, certain content. But, you know, it could, it could be used with younger. Um, and I think one of my favorite things uh, to do, actually, is to take these, like we showed at Summer Reading Games Day, we uh, recently, we showed Everything by David uh, O'Reilly, which is a very adult game. <laughs> like, it has very philosophical and very adult themes of, you know, interconnect interconnectedness and uh, yeah, just like very, very heady stuff. Um, but that's kind of my favorite thing to do is to sort of share that with you know, young children and teens and really just kind of blow their minds about what is possible. Um, so at the New York Hall of Science, all of our, all of our games, all of our, so all of our noticing tools really focus on STEM learning. So the number one thing that we think about is the content that's going into them. So how do you make this content accessible to whatever age group? That's kind of what really determines um, what, what age groups that those notice tools will be um, accessible to. And another thing that we really think about is the joint media engagement piece. So who's engaging with these? And if you do want it to be a, the type of app that's to involve students with other students, kids with other kids, or kids with parents, how do you create that experience? And kind of reiterating what the keynote speaker said this morning, how do you um, marry the content to that specific experience? And the two advices I'd have is one, talk with educators. An educator knows that if you're talking to 
uh, someone who's 17 years old about evolution, you're going to do it in a very different way than if you're talking wi or working with a five-year-old. Right? Educators understand that the differences at the different ages, and not just between five and 17, but all the steps in between, and what it means to make a family program that's focused on the kid versus the, the, the caregiver and the child working together. So talk with the folks who know. And second, work with them. Work with the young people, prototype what you're doing with the audience you have in mind, find out what works and what isn't working, get their feedback. And if you can have them involved in the development of the, the game itself, all the better. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just want to back that up. We def I personally talk with girls anytime we're putting out any sort of new programming. Um, and of course, it's going to supplement what we have. But again, testing it, because for example, with Digital Cookie, we put games in there. Girls said they wanted games. Games weren't being used. We went and talked to parents because girls aren't using the site on their own. Uh, because if they're under 13, right, they have to have a parent on the site. It's technically like the parent's site um, due to COPPA compliance. Mm -hmm. And we're like, no one's playing the games. And it's because the parents were logging on and then being like, all right, these are your sales, like approve, and, and sort of taking the, the controls back. So it's definitely just a matter of, you know, what is going to be fill the need that you have. Um, and then testing that, make sure that's going to follow through. Phil, did you want to add anything? Uh, well, just for us, uh, we're often making games that complement TV shows that we produce. Um, and that those tend to have a wider age range, especially younger kids. You know, you might think for a TV show of two to eight would watch Curious George, but for the math games that we did, for example, that's too wide a range to be useful, so we narrowed on K1. And also, you, there was a slide was up quickly, but those were actually 16 different games just focused on numbers and counting, so it was kind of a deep dive. Otherwise, we spread ourselves too thinly and we don't really set up anybody. So we really do narrowly age target, especially the younger kids, because you really have to think whether they can read or not, what their fine motor skills are for apps, how easy or hard it is to hold an iPad up that's a photographic app. That's, that's hard for a, a little guy to, to, to do for a little while. So we do have to think about that. I think it spreads out more. When I said the poisonous hand, but was for high school, we the, the value. Uh, widespread and we kept it general enough that it was useful across high school chemistry. Other questions? Mm -hmm. um, this is a question directed towards Phil, um, but anyone please weigh in. Uh, maybe it's just traditionally great media for kids. I'm really curious about how your team, just an overview of how your team determines what new game would be created, what lesson is being taught, what kind of research academic research might go into how that's developed. Because that's something, having worked with gaming, is always sort of, in, I think, backwards for some other companies where they'll have a developer say, like, we want to teach kids numbers. All right, let's do this game. Then they realize they did it all wrong. How do you do it? Do you we, we've got two hours, don't we? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so uh, it, it's a mixture. So we'll often identify what the, what the need is. Um, uh, Design Squad was came out of a realization that there was really no content for engineering for um, elementary school kids, at least at the time. It's, it's been going a while now, so we've been able to refine it over time. Um, some of it um, is, is pragmatic. There's tended to be more money for literacy and math, um, and historically for science, less so for arts. So I've been running a media literacy project for two years. That's been very hard to find funding for. It took me about five years to find funding. So some of it is, is about finding resources. Um, once we have a project, we get a curriculum together. It's a mixture often of next-gen science or common core. Or if there isn't a curriculum, we bring in advisors. There wasn't a, me a digital media literacy curriculum that was contemporary enough, but we did work with, with traditional media literacy experts like Renee Hobbs to help craft what the arc of that content should be. So there's, there's outside advisors, we create a curriculum and we weigh things against it. And then we're also, from a production point of view, thinking about what assets are available. As we're developing episodes, will it produce the kind of animation that we can customize into designed assets? So it's, it's, there's no easy way to describe a starting point, but all of the different pieces come together to then give us a consistent experience across platforms that shares a curriculum, shares characters, shares stories, shares narrative, and shares a kind of common goal of engaging kids with fun, entertaining, thoughtful, useful content. And then the kinds of games we do depend really on what seems appropriate. Is it about 
kids creating content? And if so, can we manage user-generated content at scale? Or do we give them creativity tools that they can make self-contained content? Is it about playing with, with siblings or friends? Is it intergenerational? So that those conversations come further down the line, but they're all ones that we have to think about. Thank you, Bill. Other questions? The one thing I wanted to um, ask Ciara as a follow-up, because I think you have you have the perspective for this one. We're very lucky. I live in New York City, and I have a four-year-old. I feel very lucky every day that she has so many opportunities to go to the New York Public Library, which she loves, and to go to the Natural History Museum, which she calls Bones and Whale, because um, <laughs> that's what they have. Uh, haven't been to the New York Hall of Science yet. We're, we're almost ready to do that. Um, and obviously, she's able to enjoy uh, PBS Kids programming. But kids who live outside of New York City and who live in a variety of different neighborhoods and communities, how do you address that, Ciara, when you're looking at diverse needs and designing programs that need to meet all those diverse needs? Yeah, for sure. Like I said uh, before, one of the main things is ensuring that we have something that's unplugged for everybody. So now that we've built that base STEM curriculum, we will build you know, other experiences that integrate technology. Uh, and it was really challenging, because e even as we had troops testing it, uh, girls and volunteers would be like, oh, but girls just really want to like actually build a robot. And if we're doing robotics badges, yeah, it would be great to actually build one, but the cost can be really prohibitive. Uh, and also that sort of knowledge base and having an expert on hand. And so really reducing it to what are the basics that we can teach everyone and making sure it's accessible. Uh, and then adding in those pieces slowly, where if you want to take it further, uh, also for our badges, for example, we, it's five steps and we put three options for each step uh, with the goal of really targeting, you know, like base level, if you don't have a lot of access, here's another step up and here's like, if you could just hit a home run and go tomorrow and, you know, like build the actual robot. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how we approach a lot of that. Thank you. Yes, in the back. Barry, you want to start with that? Sure. Since you showed us video of whole families having to dig under benches together. Which was funny because we invited some high school students to come. And then these adults came. I guess they were their teachers. And then there were these six and eight year olds. We never asked. We just let them all come in. <laughs> but we, we were kind of surprised it wasn't designed for the, the young kids. Okay. So uh, it, it's a great question. And I don't think there's any one right answer. I think the, the first question is, what are you trying to do, right? We, one of the things that I showed in the beginning when I showed lots of games was, was a game night we had for adults. It was uh, like over almost 500 uh, adults who came specifically to have a night with alcohol and no kids. Uh, and the place was packed. We, we sold it out two weeks in advance. People were really happy to come without kids and drink and play science games with scientists. <laughs> um, and that's one thing you can do. Another thing that we can do is design something that's specifically for young kids, um, you know, the, like the crayon set, let's say. And it's designed to be an experience for the caregiver to support the young child who they're with to be able to engage with the project, to notice something in the hall and with crayons color something on, on a sheet. That's about it. That's there to make the caregiver feel informed, not feel stupid, and then be able to be the one who gets to translate that information to the young person, to be the educator on behalf of the museum while engaging the child in, in, a, in a playful activity. Um, if that's what the caregiver wants to do, that's a, that's appropriate experience. If it's something more like an escape room where you don't want to stand around while the kids solve all the problems, that would be a bad experience, right? So I don't know if you've ever been to an escape room before with kids where there's an... I've gone with my kids before, and my kids are there to play with me, and I've been there when the parents who are there are there to let the kids play. And I've had the, one of the, 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 you know, the adults with me like, let the kids do it. But like we were there to play. So both reasons were fine. Mm -hmm. An adult who was there to help the child, an adult was there to be with the child. Um, we just were at cross purposes, but both were valid. So it's just, it just has to do with what kind of experience you want to create. And I think we have opportunities right now, museums and, and libraries, to speak to all these different types of social interactions. Because you know, going back to Marina Coven, who was quoted this morning, 
uh, this morning you know, by Colleen Macklin. Uh, games are all about getting people to connect with each other and thinking about what kind of experiences and relationships you want to have amongst them. So when we're thinking about games and playing museums, it's really another opportunity to figure out how we can get people to connect with each other when they come to our locations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to add on because for Girl Scouting, all of everything I mentioned is taught by a volunteer, which <coughs> most typically is a parent. Um, so first off, it's really important for us that it's something that's really accessible for the non-expert to deliver and they feel comfortable doing it because they will feel stupid and just give up. Adults are really <laughs> stubborn like that. Um, but then also, what can be really amazing is that they're learning alongside the girls. So while we were testing this last year, a lot of the STEM uh, curriculum, I had volunteers telling me I was really intimidated at first. I don't know what I got myself into. And then I read through it and I realized I can do this. Like it's not going to be a big deal. Like I can teach uh, com computational thinking even though I know nothing about it. And also saying that by the end of it they had learned something too alongside the girls. So I think that's really powerful as well as long as it's brought to them in a way that feels approachable and doable and like it's f they're serving uh, their girls or their children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just add that it, if you're trying to get both adults and kids to have a shared experience, that's, that's hard, again, with digital content because people get different things from their, their games or their apps, and then they, you know, kids and parents differ. So we just produced um, the third one of our fun landing apps, which are all these environmental science apps to get kids outside, but this one was designed for family use. So, again, with a focus on low-income families, we interviewed families about their technology use, what the parents' comfort level was with a phone, whether they would let their kids use a phone if they were outside, and we tried to design a kind of equivalent of a couch to 5K experience and, and a habit building, <laughs> going outside, looking for stuff, taking pictures, making observations, whatever the weather, whatever the environment they were in, mostly urban, we aimed at a kind of city. Uh, you know, plants growing through sidewalk, you know, pigeons, uh, squirrels, that kind of stuff that you might see anywhere. Um, but we tried to create an experience where the parent kind of owned the app, but then would give it to the kid to have and do the observation with. So that was kind of tricky from a design point of view, um, as well as kind of coaching the parents to say, it's okay for the kid to have the phone, it's usually the mom's phone. Uh, you know, and these are not cheap devices, so, you know, especially to be outside. Um, wandering around so that those kinds of things make testing hard and mm -hmm. make kind of the coaching hard but it's, it's worth it if we can get that that uh, as you said joint media engagement in this case around a shared app that one person at a time is using but they're using together as a family that's kind of the goal mm -hmm. i want to okay sorry go ahead go ahead go ahead Lisa, one thing. i think um at the new york hall of science something that we tr really try to do is with all of our apps, thinking about creating multiple entry points for whomever the person may be that's going to be engaging with the child. So whether it's a parent or caregiver, whether it's a sibling or whether it's a friend, there's always something for them to do or some role that they can take and it doesn't have to be the same for each person. So um, one of our apps that, one of our apps called Design Stories, what it really, what's really about is um, kind of a kid doing something, but then there's a different function in the app that allows a parent or a caregiver to notice what the kid is doing. So in that, in that particular instance, the parent is just noticing, or the caregiver is just noticing what their kid is doing, ex watching them experience a kind of learning, rather than being really hands-on and thinking of themselves as an educator or a facilitator. But then there's other apps that we have where it really is about making the content accessible so that parents can act as the educators. And then there's the rest of our apps are really focused on um, making parents facilitators. So making the content accessible, but they can take a step back when the kids are kind of on their own. So. Um, Thomas, you get the last word. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, one thing that I always think about is really meeting people where they are um, with games. So it's it's great to be able to like engage with you know people who play games all the time, um, which you know a lot of times happens to be high schoolers or um, that group. Um, but when you tell a parent, yes, you can just come in and watch what's going on. I've been just 
like blown away like uh, with the stories that have come out of that. Like it's not always what's happening even in the room or in the library if we're in that setting or in the classroom, um, but it's what comes after. So I've heard stories of um, you know, a little girl who was watching us play a game um, in the school library and she didn't want to play at all. She just wanted to watch and I think her s older sibling was playing. And then I saw her a few weeks later and she said, oh yeah, um, Never Alone, that game that you brought to my school, I played through the entire thing with my dad over the weekend and we talked about it and <laughs> it was such a fun thing. Um, and so sometimes we can't, you know, we can't force people sometimes <laughs> to engage with games the way we would maybe think they would want to. Um, we just sort of have to let them, you know, come to games on their own terms. I want to thank all of my panelists. You guys did a great job. Appreciate it.